Guys, welcome to Salt Company. My name is Dana Dreggy. I am the worship pastor at Story Hill Church. This is our third year we've been doing Salt Company. And I know right now you guys are meeting in connection groups, but the, we're gathered because Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins. And we want to celebrate that tonight. And even though the world is, is different and our meeting is different, we, we still get to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing a couple songs, and then Caleb's going to teach to us. So will you bow your heads with me as we pray for uh, our time together? Jesus, we are so, so grateful for the gift of grace that you've given us. Father, we ask that you would meet us here in this place, that you would speak to our hearts. God, even though we're, we're separate, but we're together, um, it's a weird feeling. But Jesus, the, the main reason we gather is to glorify your name. And so would you be glorified uh, in our groups? Would you be made great in our lives, God, so that um, at the end of the day, we can say that we did it all for you. So Jesus, we thank you. We love you. Just bless our time together. Amen. Sing, who is the way? Who is the way, the truth, the life? Who is the holy word of life? Who is the vision to our eyes? Who is the love that will abide? Only Jesus, only Jesus. Who is true is life. Only Jesus Christ, only Jesus, only Jesus, who is lifted high, only Jesus Christ. Who is the purpose? Who is the purpose of our days? Who is our hope that doesn't fade? Who is our courage and our strength? Who is the fullness of our faith? Only Jesus, only Jesus. Who is true is life, only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, only Jesus. Who is lifted high? Only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word, and you are the light. Only Jesus, only Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word, and you are the life. Only Jesus, only Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word, and you are the light. Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus. Who is true is life, only Jesus Christ, only Jesus, only Jesus. Who is lifted high, only Jesus Christ, yeah. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word, and you are the light, only Jesus. Only Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word, and you are the light. Only Jesus, only Jesus.
Hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought. we ask that you would be 
in this place, that you would work on our hearts, be changing us from the inside out, and we ask that you would be made great tonight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, my name's Caleb. Welcome to Salt Company. I hope you're having a great time in your connection group. Um, we love that you've joined with us. I just want you to know our aim for Salt Company this year, like what it's going to look like for Salt, it, it's going to look different. Um, obviously, I mean, we, we're not meeting in person tonight on a Thursday night. Like those who came for the first time ever to Salt Company at our kickoff, we are again so thankful you came. Guys, we had almost 100, we had 198 students at kickoff. That is incredible. Um, absolutely amazing. And most of you are now sitting in living rooms um, on campus and off campus, a part of connection groups. And so I just want you to know if that was your first time, our normal rhythm is actually to do what we did last week. We do that every Thursday. We gather and we teach and we worship, and we just be together. Um, that being said, though, our large gatherings, um, our salt companies, they're not even the most defining mark of our ministry, because what really makes salt company, salt company is what you're in right now. It's your connection group. Um, they also meet every single week, and so this year, we can't do things the way we've always done them. Um, even though that's the case, though, we still want to pursue the heart of our ministry, even if that looks different functionally. And so to ensure then the most important piece of our ministry, um, we want to set up and, and guarantee that you're in gospel community each given week, the opportunity to confess sin, to have genuine community, to have others speak the promise of who Jesus is and experience that in real, real relationships with one another. Um, so this year, um, we're going to try to do this every week, where you meet in your group, and we have Salt Company together. And, and I realize it's a bit of a hybrid, um, again, different than last year. But the push, it's going to be for you always discussing the Bible, particularly the realities of who Jesus is, um, but just also talking together about your lives and your weeks. And so we're going to spend our Thursdays, and this year, if you're wondering what it's going to look like for Salt Company Connection Groups, we're going to spend our Thursdays this year looking at how the whole Bible points to Jesus, um, how it's made sense of by Jesus, and it, it's about Jesus. Like, like understand this way, Genesis to Revelation, it, it's actually a coherent story so much so that if you remove the accounts of Jesus, the gospel accounts, it all falls apart. Um, like the New Testament, you may be more familiar with that part of scripture. Um, Do you know there's only 12 chapters in the New Testament that have no reference to the Old Testament? In fact, chapters are something we've just imposed on them um, even after the time. And so only 12 chapters, though, don't have a, a pushback to the Old Testament. And in total, um, there's almost 64,000 cross-references in the Bible. Like a, a cross-reference is where a, one piece of Scripture points back and, and speaks to another part of Scripture. And the reason I bring that up is because had the written Bible been written by one person at one time, this would be an amazing fact. But the reality it has been written by 40 different people over the span of about 1,500 years in three different languages on three continents— makes this absolutely fascinating. Um, the Bible, guys, it is complex, it's diverse, it's intricate, and yet it has one unified message. The message is simple. Jesus is lovingly redeeming all who believe in him. And so that's what we want to give this year, too, just to study how is this Bible actually a story of Jesus redeeming a people to himself. And so we're going to start in Genesis, and we're going to walk through the Bible. Um, this semester, we're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to spend six weeks looking at stories in Genesis, and then six more stories in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at how these passages uniquely reveal and point to Jesus. Um, but even more amazing, there's going to be passages we're going to spend our time in each week. Where we're actually going to see Jesus appear, like pre-incarnate Jesus, second person in the Trinity, before he became God, wrapped in flesh, born in Bethlehem, walking in Israel to die on a cross for our sins, the second person in the Trinity making appearances in humanity as recorded in the Old Testament, pointing forward to these promises. Um, amazing stories that tell us about who Jesus is and what he wants to accomplish for us. And so we're going to start that tonight, actually in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. We're just going to quickly go through those. So here's what I want you to do tonight. In your group, like right now, I want you to pause me. Actually, go ahead and pause me, and I want you to read Genesis 1 in your group tonight. So pause me right now. Okay, after you read that, like, here's the big thing I want you to know as we, as we walk through that. What, what's the main takeaway from Genesis 1? It, it's this, is we know the agent of creation 
not the age. Um, there's a lot that we don't know as we read Genesis. You may have read through that. Like, what in the world did I just read? Like, f for instance, like, how did God create? You probably have a lot of questions. Did he do this, like, in six little days as I just read? Or, or is this millions or billions of years? And what I want to tell you tonight is actually understanding the age of the earth really isn't that important. Want to know why? It's because God doesn't tell us that, guys. Like, we don't see it here. Like, we do see in the Old Testament God gives genealogies, and these genealogies um, could date it back a range of about 6,000 years from today. Um, but we also know from other places in the Bible that genealogies don't necessarily represent every single descendant in that order. Um, and we also don't know how long Adam and Eve were even in the garden. So we don't have an accurate, for sure, view of how old the earth really is. And the answer of age to the Bible isn't important because, isn't fully important, I would say, because the Bible just doesn't tell us. And so even within this then, like um, views of creation, particular views people might hold to, they aren't of ultimate significance because they actually aren't the point of Genesis. Like, like take with me even a literal Adam or Adam as a symbol who would represent years of evolution to bring mankind into being would definitely represent different time periods, age of the earth, in those two things. Like, I hold personally and believe there's biblical evidence that Adam, guys, is a real person that God made. Like, I think there's too much in the story of the Bible weaved in and out um, that points to Adam being real and what his real humanity literally symbolizes by him actually physically living, what that symbolizes to come in Jesus. And, and the fact that Jesus and Paul both referred to him as a real human being, I, I fall in this camp. But I am sympathetic to people who hold different views. Um, one view being that God could have formed Adam in a different way. Like there's theistic evolutionists that tried to hold both a real Adam and an evolution of a human species that God called and formed Adam from. Or even more, like I'm also sympathetic to people who have views that Adam and Eve are purely symbolic in Genesis 2, right? Um, me, and the reason is because some people point out rightly that the Hebrew word for Adam, I don't know if you knew this, it actually just translates to man, like it could mean mankind, meaning Adam wasn't formed from the dust of the ground like about to read in Genesis 2, but rather millions of years of evolution just brought species into existence. And like I don't fall into this camp or, or hold this particular belief, but the reason I can say so sympathetically and, and say something as bold as the age of the earth and even the identity of Adam and Eve don't have to be agreed upon by Christians, um, respective Christians, they can actually hold different beliefs in these camps is because these realities aren't the point of Genesis. That's not what Genesis is about. Like, the point of Genesis is that from the beginning, God created. God created, okay? Like, the point of Genesis is revealing who God is and that he's the one who made all of these things. Like, the point of Genesis is to show our beginning began with the relational, good, perfect, great God. And so the beauty of Genesis, then, is that from the beginning of the Bible— it says that the, the beginning of creation, it's all from Jesus. And it's actually all pointing to Jesus. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with John 1, but I'll just read it to you. Here's what it says, the first five verses. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that it had been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Meaning Jesus is the agent of all creation. This is what Genesis 1 is pointing to. But then the second thing I want us to see tonight is that not only is the Bible, it's all pointing to Jesus, it's actually specifically pointing to him buying us back as his bride. So what I want you to do now is, again, pause me, put me on pause, and have someone different in your group go ahead and read Genesis 2. So again, pause me again here and read Genesis 2. Okay, guys, what you may be seeing now um, between the two accounts you just read, these are really distinct and different from each other, aren't they? Like, um, those of you who just read these two chapters in Genesis. And so much so that, like, I fall in the camp believing you have to see one as literal and even one as poetic. And I think there's differences even more in these we don't have time to unpack tonight that point this out that make this a really strong case. But again, like, as we read Genesis 2, as I've already told you, I believe that Genesis 2 is a literal account. Um, it's how I understand it as I read it through the lens of the whole Bible, um, that, that God really made and formed a literal Adam. And so as you read then, this forming of Adam, I would take that to be actually what happened, that, 
that God really, from the dust of the ground, that he came and he formed Adam with his hands, right, intentionally. And after he formed Adam, he breathed life into him. And, and here's Adam that, that God breathes life into in this perfect world, right, this good world. And yet he looks at him, and I, and I love this. The first thing he tells him to is, like, to work. Like, work's a good thing. We see pre-fall. But in that, God looks at this good, perfect world that has no brokenness in it. And yet he says something's not good. One of the beauties of all the Bible, God says in a perfect world, something's not good. And it's that Adam was alone, meaning the, the not good thing in an all good world was that woman was missing, that Adam's bride was missing, the, the high point then of all creation. And so he said, it's not good that you're alone. And God says, I'm going to give you a suitable partner. But in this sense of like irony, and I think humor, um, God says, first, I want you to look on all the animals and name them, see if there's a suitable partner. And this zoo procession goes before Adam. Can you imagine every animal walking before them, realizing then there's, there's no one suitable for me? And at the end of that, God says, okay, I will make you a suitable partner. Um, but to receive a bride, Adam actually, God put him under and gave first surgery. We see in this passage, and he takes a rib from his side and, and forms Eve, his bride. And here's why I think then Adam's story has to be literal. That, that we just talked about, like the, from him from the dust of the ground to Eve coming from his side. It's because I think its literalness in that story symbolizes and points to something much bigger. Like, I believe that his actual humanity points to something far bigger than he and Eve. Um, th- that being, what, what most case being, is there's a plan of God for something much bigger than Eden. Like, beyond Eden, through the brokenness from mankind that's going to come in Eden. Like, there was a plan far beyond them. It was actually the plan of God always for Jesus to die on a cross and to redeem and to buy back sinful people from wages of sin, like which the Bible tells us is death, against a holy eternal God. And so this actual, and we talked about this last week, even at kickoff, so I don't want to get into it too much again, but this bride coming from Adam's side points to a bride that's going to come from Jesus. That was always the plan of God, and we know it was always the plan of God for Jesus to purchase his bride, because Revelations 13 tells us this. It actually says before the foundations of the world, before creation, which we're talking about tonight, that there was a, a book, and in this book was the name of every person that Jesus would buy back. And the name of the book was the life of the Lamb who was slain. And, and here's what this means then. What it tells us at the end of the Bible, that before creation, Genesis 1, ever started, before the beginning of time, that it was the eternal mind of God that he was going to redeem a people to himself. That this story then was always beyond Adam and Eve. It was always beyond Eden. Always beyond their marriage. A marriage that would come. And what we have to see then in this is, is what we're being shown in Genesis 2, is that Eden is not the point. Like Adam and Eve's marriage, it's not the point. Like this is not the fullness of God's plan. We have this tendency that like we missed it in Genesis 2. If we could only go backwards, humanity would be better. But Jesus is saying, no, in my redemption, I'm bringing something better and new um, to you. And so Adam and Eve then, their story, it serves to actually symbolize the reality of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. That this was actually always the point. Like as God formed Eve sacrificially from Adam's side, and then he walked with them, right? Like in the gardens. Think about that. He, he's forming Adam and he's forming Eve, the second person in the Trinity there. And then he's walking with them in the coolness of the day. I mean, this is Jesus, pre-incarnate Jesus, right? Like even then in this good, perfect garden where Adam and Eve existed, fully innocent, walking with God, the plan was for something far better than that, something beyond that. Like the plan of God was always for a people actually to be wedded to God himself, to Jesus, eternity, heaven coming to earth. And this is the beauty of the hope of the Bible. Like that the brokenness we see in the next chapter, chapter three, it didn't break God's plan. In fact, it just set it up. Like our brokenness, guys, I want you to understand this tonight. It doesn't break God's plan. Um, The fullness of Genesis two, that wasn't the fullness of God's plan for us. There was a plan far beyond that that involved brokenness leading to redemption. Like meaning, meaning this, it's actually better to be broken and redeemed by love than merely innocent. That's what we're going to see here. That is a fascinating, um, life-redefining idea that Scripture clearly points out for us. Um, So to fully understand this, though, we have to read where brokenness came into the world. So again, for the last time, I want you to pause me one more time, and the third person in your group, go ahead and read Genesis chapter 3. Okay, 
So now in Genesis 3, right? Brokenness. Um, the very thing that God says doesn't ruin my plan, but actually sets it up. And we just read it now. Um, and sinning against God at this tree. And so we, we've talked about it was God's plan before the beginning of time to redeem his people. But now we see after reading Genesis 3, this redemption is going to come at a great cost. And so not only then is Jesus the agent of creation we see in Genesis 1, and not only in Genesis 2 do we see that, that Jesus is the, actually the point is for us to be wedded to him, like to come to the stories moving forward to that day. The third thing we see about Jesus um, tonight is, is that Jesus is the one redeeming us, but he's doing it at a great cost. Like our redemption, Jesus is the one who gives the needed great cost. So in this story, um, we, we've talked about the promise of redemption, and you can actually trace this all the way through the Bible. Um, it, it's sometimes called like a scarlet thread, and you can trace our need for Jesus and seeing these allusions to um, Jesus dying on the cross for us from Genesis 3 all the way up to Jesus on the cross. And, and the first place we see it is right here in Genesis 3. Um, Adam and Eve, just as they sin at a tree um, against God, redefining our need for God because now we are sinful in our rebellion, um, at another tree, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mankind sins at a tree and redefines the scope of human history all over again. Um, but this time, not in rebellion, but in redemption. Um, so that's one scarlet thread of redemption we see in Genesis 3, where Jesus pays the great cost of pointing forward. But the other one, um, there's even more. And it, it's this idea um, that, that God, he clothes Adam and Eve, um, the beginning of promise of redemption. Like, this covering of sin is a pointing to redemption. And just think about this with me. Like, the irony um, of how much we've turned our sin covering into fashion, right? Like, we logo our sin covering. Astonishing. We, we color coordinate our sin covering. Um, our closets are full of what we deem to be the best clothes or, more likely, the best covering of our sin. And Adam and Eve here, like, they hid, right, in this chapter in shame, feeling exposed. And, and I imagine in no way felt cool um, or proud in the garments that Jesus gave them. But I, and I imagine you as well, like we get sucked into the very idea that we're meant to cover our sin, like these clothes. And it, it's become something that was never maybe meant to be. It's just ironic the way that we um, have also <laughs> perverted this, um, just like everything else are bent towards sin. And, and the reason I say all that is because there's no way they delighted in the clothing that they received because they understood here. This is costly grace. This promise of redemption came with costly grace. Do you even understand, I think, like what's happening here in Genesis 3? Like, I think you've got to kill a deer. I wish I could take all of you with me, and I know I may have lost some of you there because you're very opposed to deer hunting. I don't want to honor that. But I think you've got to kill a deer to understand the significance of what's happening here in Genesis chapter 3. Like, I love to deer hunt, but I hate to clean a deer. Um, in fact, it's gross, and I don't like it, and I don't think you should maybe trust anyone who really likes to clean a deer because that's kind of twisted. Um, the reason I hate it so much and the reason I bring this up as we talk about Genesis 3, like what does it have to do <laughs> with redemption and costly grace in Genesis 3 and pointing to Jesus? He here's what it has to do. Like the thing that I hate most um, when you cl clean a deer is the sound it makes, and this is gross, but you got to stick with me. Like the sound it makes when you pull the skin, the hide, down the deer to pull it off the deer. Um, like I, I hate that, and I hate it. I and it, I know that um, some of you, like now you hate hunting even more, but the Bible clearly says it's okay, but we can just disagree. on The reason I bring that up isn't to say good to hunt um, or even want you to experience that. The reason I bring that up is because we just gloss over that, that Jesus provided garments of skin for them to, clo to cover their sin. Because I think Adam and Eve would have hated it even more. I mean, these are animals that Adam named. I mean, this was a good, perfect world that he was called and she was called to have dominion over, to rule over, to, to protect, Right? To, to live over and protect. And here we see Jesus um, stripping this hide off this, this costly grace, the cost of life itself to cover their sin. And as we read this, we act as if like Jesus just went to the closet behind the tree and pulled out some leather coverings for them. I mean, this would have been a bloody death, like life-taking affair to cover their sin. And all of this, though, like as sad as it is, it's a story of redemption. Like, my wife, I, I love it. She was telling me, like, last night before dinner, Brandy said, I'm reading Genesis 3, 
and it's never stood out to me before um, how much the covering of sin and clothes was, was a promise that we were going to be covered in redemption. Like, here we see God showing it promise what he's ultimately going to do for us. Because just as, as tragic as the loss of life and as gruesome as the covering of that skin garments would have been for Adam and Eve and as needed as it was to point forward, how much more tragic and gruesome was it that Jesus would die so that we'd be covered in his righteousness. Like this costly grace that Jesus is promising is redefining in our lives because it's a promise of a righteousness that'll cover us now that is qualitatively different than anything Adam and Eve could ever have had before. I mean, before they sinned, they did. They existed innocent and perfect before God. And yet God says better Broken and redeemed by love is a qualitative difference, not quantitatively. Like, we can't measure righteousness that way. It's qualitatively different. It, it is better and different in every way to be covered in Christ's righteousness to, than to have never needed before. And here in Genesis 3, it's pointing forward to the promise that Jesus says, I will cover you as I give my life for you and cover you forever in my righteousness. Free grace. And it cost the life of the perfect Son of God. It's what it's telling us, this redemption in Genesis 3. And so tonight we see Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. Just like all of the Bible, they're pointing to who Jesus is, agent of creation. What he created us for. He created us to be his bride, to usher us forth as the church. And how he's going to bring us to be that in his death and then resurrection for us. Like that's the full story. Because that's the gospel. We see the gospel pointing forward in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And the rest of the scriptures is just how God plans for it to unfold. And so what I want you to do now, like I just want, as we end our time together, to actually go to your group and just have a couple questions I want you to talk about. I'm going to provide these for your leaders. Um, they'll have them in front of them now for you to talk through, but even say them now right before we end our time together. And, and the first question I want for you tonight is, who do you believe Jesus to be? Like, who do you say Jesus is? is like john 1 as we read it right like is he god who came in flesh philippians 2 it talks about it there who lived perfectly died on the cross and really rose from the dead and now bodily sits in heaven waiting to usher us a new new heaven here on earth he's coming back like who do you say jesus is who do you believe him to be the, the text begs that question of us tonight and then the second question is what do you believe to be true about your sin like, in your group tonight, like, what is most true about your sin? Do you believe it's actually deadly? Is your sin actually deadly? Do you believe it actually deserves to bring death? Like, do you realize your sin is you choosing death? Like, if, if God's the author of life, to, to choose the opposite of God is to choose death. It can be no other alternative than that. But also, your sin, what do you believe to be true of it? Do you believe that it's been conquered? Like, Jesus says, I have conquered your sin for you on the cross. And then lastly, what do you believe to be true about sin, your sin? Do you believe that you need to put it to death daily? Like, like C groups, they exist, guys, so that you can confess your sin weekly. Walk in the light. Like, the sin that kills is the sin in the dark, right? As soon as we walk in the light and confess our sin, we confess what it also is. Something that Jesus nailed to a cross and conquered. So we walk forward in repentance of it. That that's how we can't kill sin daily. We confess it, the thing that Jesus conquered for us. So from Genesis 1, 2, and 3, I just want you to talk about those two simple um, but overarching questions that, that have ultimacy for your life. Like, who do you believe Jesus to be, and what do you actually believe to be true about your sin? Um, so go to group, talk about those tonight, and we'll come back next week, um, and we'll do this again. Um, so I'll see you next week on here. We might even see you before that, but I'm just so glad that you're in groups to talk about those questions, and see you next week, guys.